Um, I'm basically going to cover what's going on with the uh, production of super carnivores, salmon, here in North America and in South America, because it's something I've been uh, doing my own form of detective work on since about 1985, um, and since 1993 at the foundation. And I think uh, I'll try and leave you with a whole lot of things that you can, that you can do. But let's shoot up a slide here. I'm completely low tech, so uh, <laughs> somehow magically this will come up. Oh, good. Um, uh, I think everyone in this room is aware that there's a, there is a conflict going on between wild uh, salmon fishery and what's going on in salmon farming. And uh, there's now over 100 of these uh, feedlots peppered along the BC coast. And I'll try and take you on a bit of a uh, scientific and political journey through how it's, how it's come to be and what there is that we can do about it. It's filled the papers. I think everybody knows Ottawa uh, basically has the jurisdiction. They've been trying to abandon it over to the province. Uh, the province isn't doing really anything in terms of enforcement or monitoring. Uh, the federal government continues to give us a lot of flim flam on wild fish policy. When I was uh, still working in my old job uh, as a BC Coastal Member of Parliament. Even back in the 80s and 90s, we were talking about getting a wild fish policy for BC, and it still seems to be stuck somewhere either in the uh, stomach or in the colon of the federal government. They just haven't been able to give birth to uh, anything useful yet in terms of protecting either salmon and habitat um, uh, or our wild salmon populations, which are truly extraordinary. We used to have uh, vast runs some, in some years in, in the range of 100 million and more in the uh, systems just here in BC. And if you extend that down to where they used to go all the way to California, it was just a massive movement of protein and biomass from the middle of the Pacific uh, back into our river systems. And these amazing things you can still go and see. I think Otto took this picture um, up in uh, the Adams River. And these are the amazing sockeye runs that are still coming back uh, to some parts of the Fraser and other systems here on the BC coast. Here is the world opioid I get to use the laser. Uh, 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 this, year, this year I went down to uh, Chile. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on what I found there. I just want you to know that it's, all, it's basically all the same companies, all the same Norwegian companies and companies that are operating here in BC and Washington and New Brunswick and in, uh, in Maine. Uh, they're down here, and the gigantic pelagic fishery that, uh, that Daniel Pauly was talking about is out here. They're scooping up uh, truly vast amounts of, uh, of sardines and uh, Inca shad and various surface feeding pelagics. They bring them on shore here, they dry them and process them, and a lot of them are used in this very rapidly growing super carnivore feedlot system that they have in Chile. Uh, which is, by the end of this year, it'll be uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500,000 tons or more. And as Danny was saying, uh, the taste buds of some people over here, particularly in Japan, who buy a lot of the coho, they grow huge amounts of coho, more than 100,000 tons this year of coho in Chile, and then they bring it around here, and they bring it up and over to here. And we've been fed uh, a lot of real nonsense by the salmon farming industry. They keep saying, oh, well, don't to worry. We're not going to be consuming so much wild fish pretty soon. We're going to be feeding them bark and grass and dirt and various things. And uh, we're not going to be taking wild fish and certainly not wild fish oil. <coughs> but what I discovered as I went around and talked to people that worked at the facilities and uh, uh, scientists and others who would talk to me. Some people didn't want to talk to me too much. Uh, uh, they, uh, in the last two years, grew very substantial amounts of coho, and they just tried to put 10% non-wild fish oil in. So when those fish were brought over and delivered into the Japanese market, the Japanese said, no, 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 we're not going to eat any of that crap. Uh, you take that 100,000 tons back and do something else with it. We don't want to eat it unless it's uh, produced with wild fish oil, because the Japanese are very large consumers of wild fish protein and have very sensitive taste buds uh, to what is actually wild and what is grown in, in, uh, in these feedlots. And I always like to remind people what it's like in all of these feedlots, having been to quite a few now myself here and, and in South America. Um, all Everybody, I'm sure everybody sooner or later has a bath here in the room, right? And when you fill the bathtub, just think of your average bathtub with two 10-pound salmon in there. 
that's about the density, about 10 kilograms per cubic meter that they're raising these absolutely glorious wild creatures in. So just imagine hopping in the tub the next time you do with a couple of 10 pounders swimming around between your legs. It's, uh, it's pretty close competition for space. The other, oh, just back to that one for one more thing. One of the things that I discovered is that the indigenous fishermen of whom there are hundreds of thousands in Chile um, have been very much displaced in part by what's going on with this gigantic capture fishery, but to an even greater and more negative extent by the uh, very rapid expansion of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sand farms. And the government of Chile is actually giving a 50% tax break to those foreign uh, salmon farmers who will take their feedlots down into what's known here as the Antarctic region. Um, the reason being they want to encourage a little bit of economic activity down here. But regrettably, <coughs> the artisanal fishermen all along here that have historically brought small amounts of fish in every day to all these small villages throughout Chile, um, uh, they are basically being moved out of all of the best fishing grounds. And the other thing is, the sound farming industry have, a, as they do everywhere, they vertically integrated. They bought up um, uh, not only the catch of the pelagics off here, and they are in virtually complete ownership of the salmon farms here, but they also control the marketing of farm salmon and sardines and other fishes in the markets in Chile. And I went to markets all the way from Santiago, all the way down to Puerto Montt, and at various places on the coast. I went into every fish store that I could get into, and I discovered universally in Chile this year, sardines, which are the principal food used by poorer people in that country, particularly indigenous people, are priced in all of those fish markets at exactly the same price per penny per pound as farm salmon. So the sardines upon which they had relied as a basic component of their diet is priced out of their diet, not by lack of availability, but because of ownership structures by big foreign fish companies who basically would prefer to have the sardines either in their net cages uh, or in other markets in the world. So the, we've just listed some of the larger ones here. I think people would know who follow this that there are some uh, salmon farming operations also here in the United States in Washington and in Maine, and there are some others in Iceland and in, uh, and in Ireland. <coughs> here in BC, a lot of people don't know when you go out to uh, Long Beach or various other places on the west coast of Vancouver Island, uh, there are all kinds of these feedlots spreading. The Broughton is a very well-known area because of what's happened there in recent years with sea lice and so on. I'll come to that in a minute. And there are now uh, sites and site approvals starting to creep up the coast. Uh, this is uh, at, uh, at Clem 2. And there are quite a number of companies really trying to pressure uh, communities up here on the north coast to try and uh, bring the open net cage feedlots up into these areas. And the different colors there you can see are the are the principal uh, operators here in BC.